Hey guys, what's up? It is week 345. I got a bunch of reviews for you. A little small update, but let's hop into the reviews. And the first one up is the 4K of Dr. Butcher MD from Severn Films, also known as Zombie Holocaust. So uh, I covered this a couple times actually. Zombie Holocaust or Dr. Butcher MD was originally made in Italy um, in 1980, and it was, it made it, uh, actually didn't make it on the video nasty list, but it lived in infamy forever. Directed by the father of NEOG. Castellari, which is crazy. This is one of the rare cannibal films without animal violence. So in the late 70s, Zombie came out in 1979 and after the popularity of Dawn of the Dead. So Zombies were really big. Cannibal Holocaust hit in 1980. Cannibals are really big. Why not mix both the genres? you get zombie holocaust it's it's guilt free because uh, there's no actual animal killings but this one essentially stars ian mcculloch from zombie and contamination fame and uh it starts off like any good cannibal kind of gut muncher should in new york city that's where all the craziness happens and so essentially what is happening is there is these kind of natives stealing they're not natives but whatever they seem to be from a different place they're stealing uh these body parts from the morgue and eating them all these kind of uh things of cannibalism are going crazy around the city a couple of people get involved with it, um, a reporter and a police officer, and it leads them all the way to this kind of jungle. So they end up going there. They meet uh, Donald O'Brien, who is this crazed doctor. He's in a slew of things like New Gladiators, and um, he's in For the Apocalypse, two Fulci films. He also pops up in Frankenstein 2000 by Joe D'Amato. He's in a lot, a lot of films. So uh, it doesn't take long before they realize something is up. Uh, Dakar is there, who is also in Zombies. So we have a, a reunion of zombie kind of cast here. And pretty soon, the cannibals attack. They start eating all these people on this trip. And of course, at first, the guides are getting killed, all these kind of things. And then, then these zombies kind of show up. And they seem to be these kind of medical experiment zombies. So uh, yeah, it, it, uh, all signs point to Donald O'Brien. That's it's kind of the plot here. Um, the two versions here, that's why there's a Dr. Butcher was late released in 1981 in the United States by Aquarius Pictures and they did this big whole thing on 42nd Street where they had these giant like medical vehicles and all these people dressed up it was kind of a, a big to do uh, and it was just kind of a nice little look at kind of the grindhouse kind of world in the early 80s so essentially the reason is there's two different cuts of this movie is because Dr. Butcher MD incorporates some stuff shot by Roy Frumkes. Now Roy Frumkes was a uh, you know, documentary filmmaker, he worked on Street Trash. Did he actually? He worked on Street Trash, and he directed Document of the Dead, the the uh, documentary about George Romero, Dawn of the Dead kind of deal. So he he was making this short film, this short anthology, along with the likes of Wes Craven, and uh, so he had a zombie footage. And the producer of Aquarius bought it, put it in the front of Zombie Holocaust. They trimmed some things out here and there, changed the soundtrack around, and that's how we got Doctor Butcher MD. They also had one of the best um, kind of basically promos for Dr. Butcher MD. Uh, what is it on here? Uh, Medical Deviant. Uh, what is it? It says depraved, crazy, and he makes house calls. It's something along those lines. It's very memorable. The trailer is excellent. But the, the interesting thing, not only is Zombie Holocaust and Dr. Butcher MD, both cuts are different. Um, the score is much better than Zombie Holocaust. That's your classic kind of Italian kind of score that's just much better than the movie deserves. And I love this movie, don't get me wrong. Um, it, is that, it, it, this is a great picture to kind of show you what they would take a movie and recut it and and kind of distributed a year later. They did this kind of stuff with Screamers, even, in 81. We have the original Island of the Fishmen directed by Sergio Martino in the, the 70s. And they kind of recut uh, Corman... Uh company shot this new opening with uh, a bunch of famous kind of actors like Mel Frera and um, Cameron Mitchell and this gory opening and then they re-released it as Screamers in 81. I'll probably watch Screamers just because of that that, that kind of two for 81 but it's just kind of interesting to kind of see that, that take and how they did this but like I said Zombie Holocaust is a film that is riddled with gore it's, it's non-stop violence, it's sleaze it has all the tropes and the classicness of the cannibal film that you, you're used to watching and some of the zombie films but it's more of a mad scientist movie in general um, the motives of, Do of, of, of Donald O'Brien is absolutely hilarious when it gets there. Ian McCulloch is solid. You know, he's a very serious kind of, st uh, you know, kind of solid starring kind of guy in these movies. I mean, he did Zombie and Contamination and did well. Before that, he was in one of the uh, the later day Freddie Francis 70s ones, The Ghoul, which I never did get a chance to see. It's never really had a nice release with Peter Cushing. But uh, yeah, the, the film itself looks spectacular in 4K. It was just kind of amazing to to watch this in 4K. And it's, it's one of those ones that has a lot of these 
like uh, uh, unintentionally funny moments just because the audacity of the dubbing the the, the forwardness of the plot the ridiculousness of the plot the, the way they get the point a to point b and all these kind of things and just how how straight faced a lot of the actors say the dialogue in general um like i said it's gory it's fun the zombies look really cool they i used to have this book um it was eaten alive by italian cannibals and zombies by jay slater and uh had the zombie holocaust zombies on there and it said it's not fear they eat you it's them and it was just always reminded me of that but uh regardless it, it's got great artwork on this it's nice like out here in bar and in, in, what is it um in boss when it comes out like that um it looks great in 4K, like I said, it sounds excellent, and there's a slew of features. I believe most of these are ported over from the old the double disc uh, Blu-ray set, but so it's five disc or it's four disc, which is insane. So we have uh, Doctor Butcher MD and UHD. We have the trailer and Zombie Holocaust and UHD on their own disc for maximum quality, which you need. Um, you're gonna want that maximum quality. But as far as Doctor Butcher MD Blu-ray, we have this, and it kind of more focuses on the distributing and that kind of all that kind of stuff in 42nd Street. So we have Butchery and Valley Hood interview with Aquarius releasing Terry Levine. That's great that's interesting he's a very funny interesting character he used to be a boxer the four brows of blood room morgues michael gingold tours new york locations of italian horror that's always great and this is it does a lot of movies too from inferno to cannibal holocaust a lot of stuff here this is one of his more in-depth ones because he does these a lot down on the deuce nostalgia's tour of 42nd street with temple shellac's chris Pelagi and filmmaker roy frumkeys they're kind of walking around and talking and, and reliving 42nd street it's a nice kind of deal there tales that tore our hearts out filmmakers frank farrell and brendan falker discuss unfinished anthology film and if i'm not mistaken i believe that those two guys would go on to work on the spookies if i'm not mistaken so they also worked on that unfinished anthology film with roy frumkeys and wes craven and then we have uh, roy frumkeys segment of unfinished anthology films that will tear your heart out with uh, accompanying director commentary the butcher mobile interview with gore gazette editor and butcher mobile uh barker rich sullivan he talks about kind of the whole big thing they put on then 42nd street cutting down butcher interview with editor jim uh, marovic illustrated essay experiments with a male Caucasian brain and other memories of 42nd Street by Severn OG marketing creative guru Gary Hertz. And then this four, we have Zombie Holocaust, Voodoo Man. We have an um, uh, interview with star Ian McCulloch, which is also great. Gotta love Ian McCulloch. He never really loved these movies, but he does a good job talking about them and, and just understands the kind of funness of it. And then we have Blood of the Zombies, interview with FX master Rosario uh, Presapino, filmmaker and UG Castellari remembers his father, director Marnino uh, Gerlami, who also I think was a little boxer. Um, then we have uh, Neurosurgeon Italian Style, interview with FX artist uh, Maurizio Trani, Sherry Holocaust, interview with actress Sherry Buchanan, New York Film Locations, 1980 and 2015, audio bonus, Ian McCulloch sings down by the river um so yeah this is insane we have dolby vision we have uh region free 4k and blu-rays so yeah if you if you like zombie holocaust or dr butcher md this is the ultimate release the 88 films version does not have dr butcher md on it so if you if you want that dr butcher you're gonna have to get the 7 4k looks great sounds great uh another fun 4k release from seven films that is dr butcher md zombie holocaust Okay, the next one here is also from Severn Films, and this is two Pierre Portabella films. And uh, pr bear with me here, of course. This is uh, Coup de Cook Vampire and uh, Unbuckle, and they both star feature Christopher Lee, not starring because these are kind of documentaries. Now, Pierre Portobello is a very interesting, strange gentleman, and uh, so this is kind of an accompanying piece, the first film here, The Vampire, um, with uh, 1970s Jess Frank uh, Count Dracula by Jess Franco. So on the set of Count Dracula, um, Pierre Portobello was basically carrying around a 16 millimeter camera and he was shooting this documentary, but it's less of a documentary and almost kind of B-roll footage kind of capturing the behind the scenes. It's in black and white and also tells the story of Dracula. It's kind of done in artistic kind of weird kind of almost voyeur way. Um, and at first it, it's kind of very standard, just following the, the script of the film, no real dialogue. And you're like, okay, where are we going with this? And as it progresses, we start to see, catch these little tiny moments that I thought were really kind of endearing on the set of this. So like at times you'll just see Christopher Lee look over and like smile or wink or somebody do something like that. And, um, I, I really enjoyed seeing that stuff. Um, there's another part that I, I really liked is that because being like an actor, you know, you see like not even, like I said, just in these cheap little movies. I was in like just all the weird shit you have to do um, even on like $10 movies and then watching Christopher Lee have to do the same shit like legendary one of the best actors of all time literally having to crawl in this cheap coffin and get this cowweb sprayed on him just made me kind of laugh that Christopher Lee of all people is doing this and I just was like that's really kind of unique to see Christopher Lee almost in a way being 
um, I, I guess the word I'm looking for is being, uh, he's, he's not, he's got his guard down, you know, it's not that prepared Christopher Lee. And there's times in this doc where you see Lee not be that so just perfectly everything aligned, you know, stiff upper lip kind of guy, which he's not necessarily, you know, he's funny, he's jovial, but he seems so rehearsed in everything he does. Everything is perfect. Everything he does is perfect that we see. But there's parts in here where, you know, he, he does the end of Dracula and he's talking about it. He's like, let me restart. And like, he does this thing and you're just like, oh, that's so interesting. And to see him prepare and do all these things like that. But uh, as far as like a feature, it's interesting if you're a huge fan of Christopher Lee or if you're a huge fan of Count Dracula or documentaries or experimental kind of documentary behind the scenes. But besides that, I can't really give it a whole hard recommend. This is just a definition of an art film kind of deal. And it's not going to be for everybody. And now we're talking about Unbuckle. And Unbuckle is a bit different. Now, Unbuckle is not necessarily, um, you know, just a, a, a straightforward documentary kind of in the vein. I mean, neither, nothing in here is straightforward, but it, it's less straightforward than the other one. So Unbuckle, it, it, it's, I don't even know how to go about this. So in the very beginning, we see Christopher Lee kind of walking around window shopping in antique shops. And we cut to these kind of weird vignettes. We flash back to an old war film and have these moments in there. We flash to these clowns kind of fighting and joking on stage. And, and then we kind of go back to these other moments. And, and to be honest, this really never came together for me. I don't really understand it. And there's a fine line between art and, and, and nonsense. And I think that the first one is that line, it walks the line and does a pretty good job. Now, this doesn't mean anything what I'm saying, right? I, I could be completely out of my league. I don't know this guy that very well and all these kind of things. But to me, this is kind of a more on the nonsense part of line. There's some buckle thing. So, so towards the end, though, you do get to see Christopher Lee recite The Raven in its entirety, which is worth the price of admission. But besides that, I can't give this a old hard recommend. And I do love like Christopher Lee and I do love kind of seeing this kind of stuff and just seeing him kind of be in his element out of his you know acting and just being himself so that is interesting but as far as the, the double feature is concerned if you're a huge fan of Dracula or Christopher Lee I would pick it up but besides that you might want to skip it it's not necessarily they look great um, because they're kind of 16 millimeter and they got that gritty look and that documentary style so that's interesting that's good and it, it's just experimental documentaries that somehow managed to get Christopher Lee shot behind the scenes in weird bizarre ways so if that sounds like it's something you like then check it out if not then you steer clear. You know, this kind of stuff is just the definition of acquired taste. But uh, as far as the features are concerned, we have a cinema of vampires, Pierre Portabella, Jess Franco in the School of Barcelona interview with Spanish film scholar Dr. Alex uh, Mentabil, uh, Vampire uh, Cuda Cook, trailer, booklet, featuring text by Pierre Portabella and film critics Jonathan Rosenbaum and Frederico Carstarsolidge. Uh, so yeah, there we go here. If these sound like they're up your alley, one's from 71 and one I think is from 72. Check them out. Uh, interesting enough, but uh, not, not everybody's cup of tea. Hold on to your britches, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this one right here might be the release of the year, one of them. And this is The Warriors 4K uh, by Walter Hill, 1979 classic gang movie. Highly influential, referenced a lot by filmmakers. Um, hell, if you listen to the, the movies that made me you hear uh, Josh Olsen bring up Warriors all the time. So basically this has both cuts on there. I know everybody's thinking, does this just have the 2005 recut? No, it has the theatrical cut. And it has the 2000 alternate version. So when this was originally released on Blu-ray, it was the alternate version from 2005. Now, Walter Hill is an excellent director. He's done stuff like Hard Times, Last Man Standing, um, Southern Comfort, um, Extreme Prejudice just so many great movies streets of fire he is one of the like basically great action or western kind of style director tough guy directors there ever was you know he he wrote the screenplay for the getaway if i'm not mistaken worked on tons of movies worked with peck and paw so like he's just kind of the guy right um and, and this is one of his his bigger movies his first movies that kind of got a lot of traction and this is the warriors now this movie had a lot of controversy at the time because it started gang fights and theaters all these kind of things like that but uh essentially this takes place in some, some sort, of, sort of strange kind of i guess not necessarily maybe slight future world where all the gangs are supposed to meet up um in new york and they send like nine representatives from every gang and they're supposed to meet with Cyrus, the man. He's like this big gang leader and he's going to unite the gang so they can take over the city. But the warriors are kind of the main focus. They're a gang from Coney Island. Um, and what happens is they're framed for the murder of Cyrus. So they're trying to get back to Coney Island and before they know it, they've been framed for it by David Patrick Kelly, great villain in this. He pops up in Commando and um, uh, a couple years ago there was the Vietnam kind of fun movie by um, Joe Bigos. What, what was it 
it called? I can't remember. I love the movie. I can't even remember its name. That's just what happens when you get old. But uh, essentially, he's in that as well. So they're trying to get back home, but then they realize that all these crazy gangs are after them, and it's up to them. Um, basically, you know, a classic Greek tale, Ulysses is what they call it. You know, the Ulysses story, you got to get back home. You have all these obstacles to get in your way. Um, there, there's some familiar faces within the gang, of course, Michael Beck. It was originally supposed to be Thomas White, or wait, I can't remember. He's from The Thing. He was supposed to be the lead, but something happened. They couldn't get the money, scheduling, whatever. So Michael Beck is the lead here. And, you know, I mostly know Michael Beck from The Warriors, but he's a couple TV movies that I've seen. 1985's Blackout with Keith Carradine, and he's also in 1985's Chiller by Wes Craven. Blackout's a pretty decent movie. Chiller is not so great, to be honest. Um, but yeah, so he's the star in this. I mean, he, he looks the look. He looks he's in good shape and everything like that. James Remar is also one of the gang members. Excellent. There's like a good eclectic mix of gang members in here because so many back in the days, you know, there's movies where there's just white gangs or Puerto Rican gangs or, or black gangs or whatever. There's Chinese gangs. There's not so much a mixture of gangs. And this was like an interracial kind of mixture gang, um, which may be not necessarily always the truth in, in the 70s or whatever, whatever it is. But uh, so the warriors basically have to get back, and they have all these different obstacles. So they have the what uh, the the crazy uh, the baseball uh, uh, furies, which are an excellent gang. Everybody knows them with the amazing face paint, and the orphans. So they come in contact with all these different groups and gangs, and have to fight to survive. And they get separated. It's just this kind of epic movie. And at the same time, we have this all kind of tied together by a radio host who's playing these songs that says, "This one goes out to the warriors," and it's just like this good structure narration over. It. Um, as far as the picture quality looks, the Warriors has never looked better. And I was so impressed with the picture quality in the opening. You could see all the graffiti in the background on the train station. Everything looks so good. Everything looks so gritty, but perfect and just the right amount of cleanup. Everything was great. The sound was excellent too, man. I had Dolby Atmos. So this was probably one of the most impressive releases of the year for me. I was just happy with everything on it, the look and the sound and having the original version because the, the new version has like the comic strips and stuff. And it's not horrible, but hey, everybody wants the original because when I was a kid, this movie movie was popular among some of my friends. They uh, had a big VHS collection and the, you know, they, they loved the Warriors and it was one that I was like, I'd, I'd never seen the Warriors so I watched it over there and I was like, oh, it's very cool and enjoy that and stuff like that. But then when I go revisit it on DVD and Blu-ray and stuff, it always had that remat, the recut so I never really got to see it again in its original form. So watching it again in its original form was just kind of a relief and it was just, it, it just flowed better, it felt better, it was more natural. It's not even that many changes but for some reason it just fucking works. But uh, any, anyways, I love this movie. Um, rewatching it kind of rekindled my love for it. You know, I remember liking it, and then when I rewatched it, I was really just didn't like it as much as I used to. But this time, maybe it's the, the remaster, maybe it's the original cut, just kind of spoke to me. And it, it's just so much stuff is in this thing, man. There's fucking stickers, there's a booklet, there's just lots of stuff going on here. And there's a lot of features too, so here we go. Exclusive new 4K masters of both theatrical and 2005 alternate version of the film from original camera negative, supervised Arrow, and director Walter Hill, 4K. Okay, and then we have Dolby Vision, uh, HDR10 compatible. Theatrical on um, both versions. Theatrical cut present original aspect ratio 185 for the first time on home video. Original uncompressed mono plus stereo and Dolby Atmos. Audio options free at the theatrical cut and the 2005 cut. So here we go. New audio commentary by film critic Walter Shaw, author of Walter Hill Film. War Stories, a new interview with director Walter Hill. Whole Lot of Magic, a new roundtable discussion with filmmakers Josh Olson, History of Violence, Les, Le, Alexei Alexander, and Robert D. Uh, Kurzlawin, the man who killed Hitler on the Bigfoot, discuss their love of the warriors and the work of director Walter Hill. Battling Boundaries, a new interview with editor Billy Weber. Gang Style, a new interview with costume designer Bobby Maxing. A Mannix, Armies of the Night, a new exclusive look at the costume designs and photographs from the archive of designer Bobby Maddox. Sound of the Streets, a new appreciation of composer Bob uh, Barry D. Vorzon. The music's great, too. And the music of the Warriors by film historian Neil Brand. Isolated score option, come out and play. A new look at the iconic locations of the Warriors Coney Island home turf. The beginning, an archival extra looking back on the Warriors came to be, featuring interviews with producer Lawrence Gordon, actress James Remar, editor Dave Holden, and writer director Walter Hill. Battleground, an archival extra in which director Walter Hill and assistant director David O. Sosna look back at the difficulties of shooting on location in New York City, The Way Home, an archival extra focusing on the look of the film with contributors from the director of with contributions from the director of photographer Andrew Laszlo, the phenomenon, an archival extra featuring director Walter Hill and the cast of the Warriors, the ethical trailer image gallery. So this is crazy. This is so much stuff going on here. Um, just entertaining ass movie. Uh, excellent. Remar is really 
really funny in it. I mean, Remar obviously has a mouth on him, says some on PC stuff, but it's 1979 gang movie. Uh, love it. Great stuff. I uh, really recommend checking this out. If you pick up one of the releases, this is one of my favorite releases. You know, Vinegar Syndrome had a lot of my favorite releases this year as well. And, you know, I love the Messiah of Evil release. Maybe I should do my top 10 favorite releases. You know, I didn't get to watch everything, but it's a lot of good stuff this year. It's always getting better. I know a lot of people are saying that so uh, that physical media is dying, that there's not as many collectors, but honestly, the, the stuff they're putting out and the way they're putting it out is just a collector's dream. So the Warriors 4K, great stuff. All right, now we're going to do the weekly Westerns. Let's go. Why not? Fill your hand, you son of a bitch! Say when. So we're going to hop into this Arrow box set here, Savage Guns, four classic westerns, and it has four westerns in here, I Want Him Dead, El Puro, Wrath of the Wind, and of course for the Apocalypse. Uh, this is the third set that Arrow has put out on these spaghetti westerns, and we're going to start with the first one here, I Want Him Dead. Okay, this is what, 1969 spaghetti western here, and this stars Craig Hill, um, who I'm not too familiar with, to be honest, um, but basically this one follows a, a simple kind of revenge story. It's kind of your typical spaghetti western. It's not... Uh, the most ama amazing storyline or anything like this. So we have this kind of ex-soldier coming back and his sister's been kind of raped and, and killed. So he comes to get revenge on a group of this thug who kind of is basically in the process of being hired to break up the Civil War uh, kind of talks so these people do not come to an agreement because the guy hiring him wants to sell more weapons and he wants us to go on forever so he can sell his stock of weapons. weapons. So essentially the bad guy is trying to assassinate a couple generals and at the same time the good guy of the story is trying to kill this guy because he has him revenge but this guy has a gang of like kind of thugs and everything like that so so this one's pretty solid pretty decent kind of hunting back and forth here he's trying to foil these guys for the most part um it's not the most memorable spaghetti western to be honest but what sticks out is the ending is really great i i think that the ending of this one is just kind of the the greed and all that kind of stuff overtaking them i think it fits perfect for a spaghetti western and i think overall it's pretty solid because of that um I don't know where this sits in the set. It's definitely not my favorite, but um, it's probably, honestly, um, three of them are around the same and one just sits miles above them. But I Want um, Him Dead is a pretty solid spaghetti western. As far as the special features are concerned, we have brand new audio commentary by critics Adrian J. Smith and David Flint. Dead or Alive, brand new introduction by journalist and critic uh, Fabio Malini. The Man Who Hated Violence, brand new interview with director uh, Pablo Baccini. And Cut and Shoot, brand new interview with editor Eugenio Albizzo. Nico Unchained, archival interview with the composer Nico uh, Findico, who is one of the better Italian composers of all time. But uh, this one's pretty solid. Looks good sounds good i mean i don't have too much to say about this one that's the problem with watching four spaghetti westerns if it's not completely different from the other ones it kind of blends together this one i do remember the ending and i do remember the villains um the hero is okay like i feel like two of the two of the four heroes in this are lacking in terms of like especially i, I think this is the hero kind of in the film that, that out of all of them it kind of lacks a bit but i want him dead it's all right okay the next one here is el puro and this one is really interesting kind of different from the last one for sure 
sure. And this one kind of stood out in a, in a lot of ways in comparison to some of the other spaghetti westerns I've seen. So what we have here is this legendary kind of gunfighter who's become this like kind of sloppy drunk that no one really respects anymore. And his legend has faded so much. No one really knows that he's this guy. Um, and there is this character who is basically a, a criminal. He's escaped with a with an excellent way. He escapes in the stagecoach in the very beginning with like three or four other guys. And all the villains in here are really memorable uh, character actors. You recognize a lot of them. Um, there's like five of them um, along with the lead, and you you recognize all of them: Cassidy and, and uh, Tim, and, and uh, they all have like these names, Specs. And they're, they're this is one of the times where like you actually like kind of take a page out of like the Sergio Leone, where you're like, I know these villains. They're really Really good. So essentially, the main henchman here is unhinged, completely unhinged, obsessed with this Piro guy. And he feels like he can't continue his life. He can't do anything unless he takes him out. So his obsession is to take him out. But at the same time, this guy has become this broken down drunk that's just a complete loser that lives in this small town. And through the kindness of this barmaid, um, he starts to kind of rebuild himself up and become something else. There's this young kid who knows of him and he kind of helps him out and all these kind of things. Of course, tragedy strikes and El Piro must kind of, you know, get become his old self, become that possible legend that he once was to stand out. Now the bad guy in here, there's this really kind of weird scene where he like kisses another, the bad guy's on the lips out of like weirdness because the guy does something so horrible. Um, and, and there's this great kind of moment where like the bad guys kind of ride up on this person and the, the main bad guy starts listing all his guys with them and he says, this guy is a child rapist. And this guy, and he goes through his specs. Now he's pretty, and all this whole thing like that. And you're just like, there's these little tiny moments that just make this one stand out and become a little bit more memorable than a lot of the other spaghetti westerns so i think el piro is actually a pretty good one maybe the second best of the set honestly i think i would put this behind for the apocalypse which is obviously clear winner for me but this one's pretty good pretty interesting stuff um and the ending again dark as shit and the actor who plays specs is just an actor i've seen in a bunch of a bunch of these things and he's really good at it too but uh yeah the bad guys are good um and that's really kind of the hero is interesting the bad guys are good the score is good that's kind of what you look for in a spaghetti western and that's what we have here and the story is different too but as far as the special features are concerned we have have um, two versions of the film, the 98-minute cut, uh, presented in Italian and English, and the longer 108-minute version assembled from original camera negatives and archival print presented in both Italian and newly created hybrid English-Italian mix. So it's the longest cut possible. Brand new audio commentary by critics Troy Haworth and Nathaniel Thompson. That's great because they talk about the actors, what they did, all these kind of things. A Zen Western movie. Brand new introduction by journalist and critic Fabio Malini. Brand new interview with actor Robert Woods. Brand new in-depth appreciation of the soundtrack and its composer Ali, uh, Ali, Alexandro Alex Draudini by musician and disc collector lovely john um who knows everything there is to know about uh <laughs> scores and everything like that but yeah this one is my second favorite of the box set i think okay the next one here is the wrath of the wind starring terrence hill and fernando ray and uh yeah terrence hill um and, along with bud spencer became very famous for doing these kind of uh comedic spaghetti westerns and everything like that but this one's a little bit more serious right in the opening of this one terrence hill and a young assistant or friend of his kind of like a little brother basically brother figure character um assassinate this guy in this crowded area in a really violent way and they kind of run away and and as it progresses we learn that terrence hill is this assassin he's just this awful kind of assassin along with his younger kind of brother that they both were from an orphanage and although it's not his real brother they are treated as brothers and they're basically hired by this this cattle baron to break down all these workers and just kind of create all this chaos. But of course, our hero in Terrence Hill, our reluctant hero, our anti-hero, becomes kind of infatuated or in a relationship with this young woman, and he starts to have his, his tide turn, but his brother doesn't feel necessarily the same way. Um, and Fernando Ray is a really cold, heartless son of a bitch in there, and he has two kids. And uh, as it progresses, we learn that some of the other landowners maybe not as aggressive as Fernando Ray. But as it goes on, it ends as a spaghetti western show should end you know people are punished uh they lose everything that they would ever want for it um more so than you know their own life they lose other things like that and and the ending is again very dark um, I think this one is good. I think this one is a solid spaghetti western as well. I think that uh, a lot of these are dark. You know, watching uh, El Puro and Wrath of the Wind, I was like, man, I'm here. I'm getting some great silence vibes, um, and not as good as the Great Silence or as, as, as snowy, obviously, but kind of that dark edge where they're just like, fuck it. You know, this isn't going to be a happy ending. This isn't going to be, uh, you know, a very happy film. And I think that this one is, is a good one too. And the ending, I, I saw kind of coming to a certain point. It had to end that way. But I really do like what happens to. 
Rondo raise kids. And I like how that plays out. I think it's just kind of a perfect, you know, um, a, a fitting ending for Fernando Ray in the film. And I thought that was probably the most interesting point about it. And again, um, we do have a lot of these cattle ranchers and everything like that, but this one seemed a little bit darker, a little bit bigger budgeted than some of the other ones I've seen that follow that kind of storyline. There's like, you know, the classic cattle ranchers clearly always the villain in these. But as far as the features are concerned, we have an alternative um, 106 minute Spanish language version of the film featuring additional extended scenes not found in the Italian or English versions. Brand new audio commentary by author and critic Howard Hughes. Uh, Compensaneros, Al Border, a brand new introduction by journalist and critic Fabio Molini. The Days of Wrath, brand new interview with camera operator Roberto D. El Torre Pazzoli. They call it Red Cemetery, a short film by 2022 by uh, filmmaker Francisco Lacerda, serving as a love letter to spaghetti western genre. Alternate Revenge of Trinity opening titles, newly restored for the release, of course. My name is Trinity, Revenge of Trinity, Terrence Hill. But anyways, a uh, good one. Third favorite of the set, I would say. Uh, close to El Piro, but not better. Okay, and last, but certainly not least, is the cream of the crop of the set. The one, the only, for the apocalypse by uh, Lucio Fulci, one of my all-time favorite directors, starring uh, Michael J. Pollard, uh, Fabio Tessi, uh, Thomas Milan. I can't think of this actress's name. She's also excellent. Let me, I don't want to, uh, Lynn Frederick. She's in a couple other films, too. So, For the Apocalypse, I had seen before, and it's been a long time since I watched it, so I was waiting for a Blu-ray finally to get released. Um, and one of the Spaghetti Western sets had Massacre Time in it, uh, Fulci's first Spaghetti Western, which is an excellent one with uh, George Hilton and Franco Nero. So, I was really hoping that we would see for the apocalypse popping up on on blu-ray and i gotta say uh it looks great sounds great uh yeah so anyways for the apocalypse is not like your typical spaghetti western it's kind of late in the run it's like the mid 70s here um it has Fabio Tessi in it, who would go on to be in Fulci's Contraband. It has Tomas Milan in it, who was in uh, Fulci's Don't Torture a Duckling. It's got some familiar faces. Donald O'Brien, who ends up to be a new gladiator. So in the very opening of this movie, they're kind of t breaking down on this small, like, kind of this rancher town or whatever. And um, Donald O'Brien, all these people are getting arrested. He re Fabio Tessi comes in, he's like this slick gambler. He's got all these nice cards. And he's like, he just starts burning him and he locks him in the cell with um, this, this African-American gentleman who sees dead people. Michael J. Powers a drunk and Lynn Frederick who's this prostitute and he, he locks him up and he's like you guys got to stay here we don't want this kind of stuff in our town right now and at the same time these kind of crazy vigilantes go through these extremists and they kill everybody in the town because it's riddled with sin Donald O'Brien does nothing to lift a finger and and when he, he brings him out of the cell he says what money you got um, Fabio Testi takes some of his money and he gives him a wagon and says get out of here you know go you know basically kind of saved their life in a way so this starts this kind of crazy kind of weird adventure kind of people on a, a, a journey kind of film and as times they run into this religious group and they have these conversations and at the same time Lynn Frederick and Fabio Tessi start this kind of this loving bond and over time the group starts this kind of family unit until they run into Thomas Milan who is just kind of a really crazy hunter and he's just nuts and over the top and he's he's a vicious son of a bitch and and I don't want to spoil exactly what happens but some really dark stuff happens it is a Fulci film so you know it's not a horror film but there ends up being cannibalism there ends up being kind of uh, darkness and sadness and just kind of all kind of emotional stuff happening in it. Uh, the score is excellent. It actually has people working on it from um, Fa uh, Fabio, uh, Fabio Frizzi's on here which is excellent, and, and they kind of talk about the history, and there's this feature on here where, uh, I think it's Lovely John, yeah, Lovely John talks about the breakdown of, of all the music and how they got to this point and how Fulci met them, and that's really interesting shit too. But, uh, you know, re-watching this, I was really impressed how it played out, and I, I just... I loved it, and the ending is is based off a, a book, a story um, that's been done a couple times with the kind of the cattle town and all these kind of these tough like drinkers and everything like that. And there's this this baby being born, and they all kind of soften up, and it's a really touching kind of emotional moment. Um, and Fabio Testi, you know, you got Thomas Mulan, who's like a method actor, and Fabio Testi, who's not, he's not really a method actor, but you know, he's a handsome leading leading man type, and his performance in this, I think, is very strong. I think it is very strong. I think the tears in his eyes and the relationship between him and Lynn Frederick seems genuine. It seems touching. Michael J. Pollard is also excellent. He's a classic character actor in Scrooge and Bonnie and Clyde and Dick Tracy and American Gothic and just in everything. House of a Thousand Corpses and tons of old Hollywood classic, new Hollywood movies, I mean. So, like, so many of these actors are in here. And, and the guy who sees dead people is also really good and really strong and has these moments of, of just interesting, kind of heartwarming, kind of almost bizarre 
bizarre kind of almost surreal moments. It's like an acid western at times. The music is also super bizarre. It's one of those scores that's like, and then they walk down and they saw that thing and it's just like like Kioma which you cannot compare it to it's same year as Kioma where Kioma's like and then he shoots his gun it just explains everything now some people might be like this sucks this is annoying some people may dig it it depends you know how many acid flashbacks you have during it I, I don't know I'm just kidding but seriously I, 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 I like the score I like the soundtrack I like the acting I like everything kind of about this movie I think it is really interesting and sad um, and good and it's one of Fulci's best honestly it's one of his best main movies. You know, I love his horror films. But Fulci is just such a, a better director than he gets credit for in terms of variety and being different in, in his style, but also somehow carrying it on. No matter the kind of movie it is, it's still a Fulci. You still see Fulci in there. And I can't say the same thing about all the Italian directors. Like, I can't see, you know, uh, you know, like every Lenzi movie, I don't see Lenzi in there. I, I see Argento, of course, and Bava and, and Fulci and Diodato most of the times they're in there. But especially Fulci, you know, I'm just more familiar with them. I see it. I see the, the patterns, the themes. And it just, I guess you'd say in our tour in a way, but, you know, when he works with people like, you know, Fabio Frizzi or D D Dardano Sacchetti and just a lot of these Sergio Salvati, you know, is on here in the cinematography, it just really works. And, and and Kat Ellinger does the commentary. She points out, man, some of these desert landscapes look like the end of the beyond, you know, when they're walking into the beyond with uh, when um, David Warbeck and Katrina McCulloch are. So it's just like, yes, 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 I see it. I see a lot of this. And, and the commentary is good by Kat Ellinger. Love that. Um, there's a lot of good features on here. Um, so we have the commentary by Kat Ellinger. Love that. Apocalypse Now, brand new interview with journalist and critic Fabio Molini. It takes four previous unreleased interviews. Production manager Roberto uh, Sabragini. Uh, brand new in-depth appreciation by film critic uh, Arthur Lucio Fulci scholar Stephen Thrower. Gotta love that. He points out a lot of great stuff. Brand new in-depth appreciation of soundtrack and composers Franco Brizio, Fabio Frizzi, and Vince Tempura by musician and disc collector Lovely John. So uh, the cream of the crop. Excellent Spaghetti Western. Excellent Fulci movie. So uh, if you don't want to get the whole set, maybe they'll release it by itself. I don't know, but uh, it's worth it for this. And I would put this, El Puro, Wrath of the Wind. Uh, this number one, Puro and Wrath of the Wind kind of here, and then I Want Him Dead, kind of the last. Doesn't mean it's bad. Just means it's kind of standard to me. Um, two good. One okay, two good, one great. That's a good set. Uh, check it out. Uh, Savage Guns, Spaghetti Westerns there. Okay, next up is going to be a 4K. I decided to treat myself again and wanted to watch a Vinegar Syndrome 4K, and I decided to watch Blood Sucking Freaks, or The Incredible Torture Show. Yes, this is directed by Joel M. Reed, who drew Bloodbath and 19 Z Night of the Zombies 1981. Yes. Um, so, uh, Blood Sucking Freaks is definitely his call to fame. This was distributed by Troma, or picked up by Troma at one point. So I had not seen Blood Sucking Freaks since probably 10, 15, maybe even longer. But I always remember it being an incredible incredibly violent and disgusting movie but very funny at the same time and that's still how I remember Bloodsucking Freaks after watching it so we have here somewhere in between you know Herschel Gordon Lewis and Hostel right um, like right in that middle kind of like it has the kind of mindset of a Herschel Gordon Lewis movie but if it was more sexual and more comedic purposely and it kind of has that kind of rendition the Grand Ganole kind of style theater and <clears throat> Listen to Joel and read talk and, and stuff and, and see like his constant jokes about like being perverted and sex. You're just like, eh, it does not age well, especially when you have characters like Zardu. Uh, I think that's his name or Zar, Zar, or Zara, whatever the fucking guy who <laughs> runs this show in the movie is talking about things like, all you need to do is add a little ballet number and you can add as much eroticism and violence in as you want. And it's just like, oh shit, man. I mean, like you can just add a little eroticism. You can add as much violence as you want. And you're just like, yeah, it just feels so weird that he's into that. It just feels a little too on the nose there. But So essentially, the plot of Bloodsucking Freaks is there's this traveling group of uh, strange people that uh, there's four of them. There's the leader, and then he has the Ralphus, who is a, a dwarf, and then these two kind of diamond matrix women that uh, basically kidnap women and torture them on stage, cut out their brains, and everything. everybody thinks it's Grand Ganol. They think it's theater. They think it's fake. But in reality, it's real. So uh, our leader of this blood-sucking freaks decides he has his eyes on this ballerina. He kidnaps her. His, her boyfriend is this famous football player who hires a cop to try to figure out what the fuck is going on. So that's essentially the plot of the movie. But a lot of it is just horrible torture, horrible violence, a lot of sight gags and jokes and just goofy kind of things like that. The movie is darkly comedic and gross. Um, it's, it's legit torture porn in a lot of ways. There's tons of nudity 
tons of stuff like that. There's a whole basement full of naked, starved women that turn into cannibals by the end of it. The special effects are cheap, but they're fun and they're effective and they're plentiful. Um, there's a really graphic scene that I absolutely never forgot where they hire a doctor to check on this woman and he takes out his payment and trade. And what he does is so disgusting that even the blood-sucking freaks won't allow him to live. Uh, so, so there's just that moment as well. So, like, this movie has always stuck out to me. It's, it's and and you know, rewatching it, I enjoyed it. I'm not gonna lie. It was fun. It's nasty. It reminds me if if Wizard of Gore had a better plot and just I shouldn't say this. Actually, tried. <laughs> I shouldn't say that shit, right? But I, I mean, I, I I you know, guys know how I feel about Hershey Gordon Lewis movies. He's a very he's innovative for sure, and he changed the the landscape. But at the same time, he'll tell you point blank, I didn't give a shit. You know, and, and, and like it just seems like he didn't care. So Joel M. Reed obviously is is somebody who's just completely batshit crazy. Um, it's just a lot of taboo breaking things in here, necro necrophilia, um, just torture, all this kind of stuff in here. There's a penis sandwich at the end, which is is laughable as shit. You know, some of the some of the special effects are so bad they look like like a microwave massacre in a penis sandwich. You're just like, what the fuck is this? But uh, there's a couple moments in here where I just caught myself laughing and just like the, and, and and even Lloyd on here on the new features. He's like, you know, this is probably out of all the movies we distributed. I, I don't think I distributed this one again. And you're like, fuck. And I could see why, honestly, especially with Joel and Reed's history and stuff, what happened afterwards. As far as the features are concerned, we have contains the 89 minute on cut feature, uh, presented in HDR. It looks excellent, um, especially the outside shots look excellent. I mean, for a low budget, cheap movie like the outside exterior shots, I'm like, wow, this stuff looks so clean. The city stuff looks so clean for a cheap movie. Then we have, uh, um, Basically, what do we have? Uh, author of what was new commentary track with John uh, Spalbar, author of Bloodsucking Freak, The Life and Films of the Incredible Joel and Reed, an archival track with Eli Roth, filmmaker and fan of Bloodsucking Freaks. Also included on the Blu-ray disc uh, is Freaks Come Out at the Drive-In, a feature read about the Tromathon 2023 screening of Bloodsucking Freaks at the Mohunning Drive-In Theater in Lenton, Tang, Pennsylvania, including interview with Troma President Lloyd Kaufman. Live commentary from 2009 screening with director Joel M. Reed, our editor and Ken Kish, Q&A with Joel M. Reed, Cinema Wasteland Hotel interview with Joel M. Reed, which is really bizarre. It's up in his room and he just just keeps making these weird things like all these girls in Pittsburgh down there. It's like other, they want to have sex with me. And you're just like, I don't know what's happening here. Uh, live com Okay, then we have archival introduction by Lloyd Kaufman, archival cast and crew interviews, archival interview with Eli Roth, Bloodsucking Freaks fan and filmmaker, archival interview with Chris Jericho, Bloodsucking Freaks fan and professional wrestler, alternate title sequence. Unfortunately, the guy who plays, what the fuck is his name? I, I just really, uh, Zardu, um, died a year after this. So that's unfortunate because he's really good in it. He's really funny in it. Um, and him and Ralphus, their back and forth is also good. But, uh, you know, this is an entertaining, crappy, shellacky, nasty, movie that has probably not aged well for most people but if you know what you're getting yourself into i think you'll enjoy blood sucking freaks uh i know i do i like it it's good stuff it's fun it's from trauma of course but yeah looks great in 4k um especially for a cheap nasty movie it doesn't deserve this good a release but i'm glad we got it all right guys let's hop into those 1981 movies woe be unto him who opens one of the seven gateways to hell because through that gateway evil will invade the world
Valentine's Day is a curse that'll live on and on And no one will know as the years come and go Of the horror from long time ago In this little town when the 14th comes round There's a silence and fear in the air Remember the morn that the legend was born All the shock and the horror was there Or oh, the legend they say on a Valentine's Day Is a curse that'll live on and on And no one will know as the years come and go Of the horror from long time ago And no one will know as the years come and go Of the horror from long time ago Okay, let's be brief with the 81 movies this year. You know, I'm getting to slim pickings here. The first one up is going to be Christmas Spirits. Yeah, it's just in time for Christmas. So, Christmas Spirits basically follows the story of Elaine Stritch. Uh, she's a classic actress. She's in stuff like Scrooge with Norm MacDonald and Dave Chappelle. She's really funny in that. But essentially, she is this American that's coming over to kind of scout this this old kind of British-like mansion to film a ghost story, film a horror story in there. And when she gets there, this is a TV movie. It's like 40 minutes. Um, and when she gets there, basically the couple there tell her, you know, something really tragic happened to our family here where his daughter, where one of the kids ended up killing another kid, basking in their whole family. She's like, I wouldn't tell anybody about that, but this makes that a better story. We should do that story. So anyways, basically what happens is she ends up getting locked in here and she starts to kind of lose her mind, lose her sanity while she waits for somebody to come rescue her. But it's just kind of funny in the point because a lot of it is just um, Elaine Stritch in her mind. Like, what was that? What was that sound? What's going on? And it's just a lot of inner monologues. So it's a lot of that kind of stuff and spooky rumblings and everything. Thing. Overall, it's effective, but it's not really much to look to. It's not really, it's not that much stuff happening, to be honest. But for a TV movie, I guess it's fine. Maybe put it on on a late Christmas or something. I don't know. Late Christmas night staying up. All, all in all, it's okay. It's fine. She's a good actress in it. Um, it's talky, but there is some really funny stuff. It's just her kind of like just talking to herself, getting scared, and it doesn't seem to end. She talks to herself like 10 minutes about this door locking itself and all these kind of things like that. But uh, it does end on a really dark note too so christmas spirits uh, maybe worth a watch it's on youtube you can find it um it's not the worst time waster but it's probably still a time waster Okay, the next one up is called Wicked Wife, and this is a bizarre one. This is a Taiwan film dubbed in English, and I think there's probably a longer cut of this this film than what I saw. I saw about an hour and 25, 27 minute version. So essentially what we have here in the very beginning, somebody seems to be killed by this like tiger and their and whatnot, and, and then we kind of like are into like this woman trying to figure it out, and I think she like runs maybe this possible, this like this kind of like um essentially a bar or a brothel or something along these lines. And over time, a lot of the suspects that are possibly the people who killed this woman's husband start ending up dead. They get lured out into the jungle or the woods and there's a tiger that attacks them and we assume that maybe somebody's turning into this tiger and killing them. And that's basically the mystery of it to figure out what the hell is going on. It's it's really a weird movie with some like magic touches and supernatural touches, but mostly focuses on the kind of like a mystery about it. Uh, overall, it's just weird and bizarre and not necessarily the most coherent story either maybe the the translation maybe just some cut out overall it's all right i've seen a lot worse i enjoyed it for the most part but i couldn't really come back and tell you every little detail about wicked wife i mean like this is going to be like a 35 second review um but it, it, it's interesting to the point at one point like she's sitting there at the table and he's like will you come back he's like maybe next week you can come with me and then like the guy's like what about me he's like nah week after next i go in order or, like i don't like it's so weird like a lot of these films that exist like wicked wife um overall i think it's worth worth watching i guess like there's also like another kind of weird mystery kind of like wizard in here if i remember correctly this is the problem with watching these movies that are very kind of like easily forgettable and very poor quality that just don't really have much to say about them um especially if they're just shoddy releases in general or no releases but wicked wife uh, overall i think it's okay I, I really can't give it a, a whole hearty recommend, but I, I would. I, I think it's one of the better kind of incoherent uh, Taiwan or Hong Kong movies I've watched. I've watched a lot of good Hong Kong movies, but the, as, as far as the incoherent ones, this is probably the best of the bunch. Okay, now for the Patreon pick, and I know, I think this was uh, a Jonathan Wilhelm pick, and he picked Exist uh, from the director of The Blair Witch Project. I think that would be Eduardo Sanchez, who also directed Altered, which I really enjoyed. It's been years since I watched The Blair Witch, but uh, Exist. So this came out in 2013, 2014, and uh, I remember 
never a lot of buzz about it because I was like, oh, it's the, the director of Blair Witch. It's a found footage. It should be interesting and stuff like that. I'm not always the biggest fan of found footage, but some of the great movies that are found footage are amazing. Cannibal Holocaust, you know, some of the murder, death, Korea time. There's a lot of great ones, okay? Let's let's be honest. So I was like, Exist. All right, it's a Bigfoot one. That's very cool. There's not that many great Bigfoot movies. I mean, I like Night of the Demon, Abominable, you know. There's there's a handful, a couple, you know, not too many great ones. But uh, so, so this starts off and... And here we're going to have this argument here. And I'm going to say this now before somebody jumps in. I don't have to like characters. I do not. I do not have to like characters. There's tons of 70s characters that are really gray, that are really shady, that are really shitty, that are not our people I do not like. But guess what? They're interesting to watch. They're well-developed. They have depth. They question something about society and make you question yourself and question other things. It's interesting. The characters that exist are cookie-cutter. They are boring. They are catalysts to move the story along, which is fine. The story is okay. The story is there for scares. The story is there for tension, suspense. Um, this movie, though, it, it does work for a lot of people. A lot of people get scared of it. A lot of people have the tension. It does not work for me. I am bored to tears. This is the second time watching this movie. It just does not work for me. I cannot stand watching Mountain Dew Dorito kids ride mountain bikes and see a Bigfoot out of the corner. I just don't like it. I'm sorry. I hate, I don't like this movie. I don't think it's the worst movie ever. I think the Bigfoot looks fucking excellent. Um, it's just overall, I just don't like the movie. I just, the characters are annoying. They're loud. They're they're boring. They have no background. They have nothing to them. There's nothing underneath. There's nothing there for me to grasp on. And again, I understand they're just there to move the story along to be cannon fodder. But in a found footage movie, I need something. I got to have something and, 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 and people would say, well, it's spooky and suspenseful. And it's just, I, I have a hard time focusing on really shaky stuff, especially when I can't care about who the fuck is there. I, I just don't like it. I, I, I cannot like it because due to the, 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 the characters, um, due to the way it unfolds, it's very generic. It's just there's nothing here that catches my attention. And at the end, the Bigfoot looks excellent and the reveal is cool, but also highly depressing on top of that. It's just like, I couldn't watch these characters die fast enough. And there's no enjoyment for watching characters I don't want to watch die because I don't care what happens to them. That's how I feel about Exist. I know it's shitty. Um, and and it's just essentially, it should have been a VHS short. It should have been 15 minutes and it would have been really cool. But since it's an hour and a half, it wears out its welcome. It's just not a thing that I care about. And I, I know I'm coming down hard on this movie. I know a lot of people like it. I do not not have much more to say about Exist, so I'll just end it there. Great Bigfoot. Good director. Don't like this at all. All right, let's get these questions, comments, concerns, all that jazz. So, uh, Data DeBaser. A gun for Jennifer, Jennifer deserved much better artwork for its Blu-ray debut. Still bought it as it's a personal fave of mine, too. Great. I agree, man. Bl Brian's Mask. Awesome reviews and enjoyed the video. I learned a lot. Look forward to more of your videos and reviews. Thank you. Nick Nancy, 1312. God damn, you're beautiful. Also, my ex-boyfriend's all-time favorite movie is Meet the Feebles. R.I.P. I'm sorry. Uh, great great choice, though, and thank you. Um, Turbos. Used to rent uh, Daryl all the time for my local uh, library when I was a kid. Stoke Scab. Meet the Feebles is great. I love Peter Jackson's old stuff. Frighteners was his last awesome film, in my opinion. I love how Sam Raimi doesn't forget his OG fans and still puts things out to please us. I wish Peter Jackson would do the same. I want Dead Alive 2 or Brain Dead 2, not the boring ass Hobbit movie. Also, I have the German hardbox version of A Gun for Jennifer. I bought it years ago because of you. There are at least 200 movies in my collection I bought because of your channel. I owe you. Sorry for the long post. No, no, I love it. Thank you. I, I hope you liked all the movies. Uh, One Bad Jesus, Trevor, and Meet the Feebles. Greatest henchman in cinematic history. Great video. Liked and subscribed. Thank you. Ah, uh, Trevor. Love Trevor. Trevor. I, I don't want to say. Ken Coakley, um, I'm a fan of the prophecy films as a Christian. My two favorite stories from the Bible are War in Heaven uh, for God's Throne as well as Z's The Rapture. The prophecy wasn't exactly the War in Heaven. It's more like their versions of uh, World War II. They did show snippets of the War in Heaven, but only bits and pieces. In the Bible, Gabriel, played by Walken in the prophecy, led the loyal angels along with Michael, played by Eric Roberts, fought the renegade angels, led by Lucifer, played by Viggo Morganson. The original War in Heaven may, would make an interesting film. Heaven is on familiar terrain, so it could be open to interpretation. It could be a trilogy a 
all the Lord of the Rings or Chronicles of Narnia. I would also think a big budget film based on the Rapture would be interesting. There are tons of movies about it, but the movies are on such a low budget they show nothing. The closest movie that showed some things was the remaining. They showed Six Foot Locust and Scorpion Tales. The 1994 film The Rapture only showed the Four Horsemen through TV screens, but a film uh, on a decent budget could show it all. The Four Horsemen as well as Jesus coming from on the clouds over the Hudson River filled with blood. I believe that even non-Christians would like it. The 1980 Pakistani film Satan's Slave it had Muslim NMs driving out the ghosts and it was a great movie. Yeah, Satan's Slaves is great. Um, I think technically it's for 82 on, uh, for, for Internet Movie Database. Who's probably going to watch it for that one. Um, but uh, so... Yeah, like I understand. Like, like I watch so many of these movies about the rapture from eighty, eighty one, and they're just like cheap. Like, it's hard. I mean, they're gonna they would have to disguise the movie as a non Christian movie, I think, to get the money. Uh, to be honest, it's like on a lighter note. Someone asked you if there were any older video companies that you miss, and you mentioned Anchor Bay, which was a good call. I love their collector tins. I remember buying their Hellraiser tin at Suncoast when I was working at the time, then going to a horror theme park called Spooky World. Doug Bradley was there, and I left a tin in my car. Another label I was going to mention was Media Blasters. Then in your update, you had a Media Blasters title. It's true that the absence makes the heart grow fonder. Back in the 80s, the Vestron logo that came before each movie irritated me after hearing it so much. Now I have to collect the Vestron titles on Alliancegate. I know what I feel. The Nick Mua from Belgium. The new Count Dracula release looks delicious enough to take a bite out of. Though I heard a rumor that 88 films are releasing it as well come 2024 with a Kim Newman plus Barry Forshaw commentary. Which version does a movie buff buy? Or do I buy both? Choices. They might just drive us mad. Questions. Mr. Franco's Dracula is arguably one of the best adaptations of Bram Stoker's book. What's the worst adaptation according to you? Boy, I don't know the worst i mean there's probably dozens of really terrible i mean in terms of like just quality film or in terms of actual following the story because none of them follow the fucking story probably but in terms of just bad movies i'm sure there's a hundred bad dracula movies do you think there is a source novel for zombie literature and films like dracula and carmela did for vampires I, I there may be i'm not sure i know that i can't think of one off the top of my head but there's got to be there's got to be a Haitian one kind of deal. But if you're talking to like a Romero style, no. I would say the closest to that would be I Am Legend by Richard Matheson. Um, uh, three, will you be doing another Blu-ray commentary in the upcoming year? No plans, no one asks, and I don't put myself out there to do them. But the last time was a very special kind of occurrence. Um, way up, dude. Uh, he gives me a smiling blue face. Thank you. Stephen Hyde gives me muscle heart. Thank you. Steve Simpsons guy. Meet the Feebles is my... Uh, favorite Peter Jackson film as well. Super underrated. When the frog has his non-flashback. One of the most ridiculous sequences I've ever seen. Pure gold. Uh, I love that movie. I can't. <laughs> the problem is I want to quote the movie, but half the shit is just not appropriate to say anymore. Travis, ever, probably. Travis Linscum. I picked up a gun for Jennifer on Black Friday because of your praise. I haven't checked it out yet. I have to admit that I was hoping you were on the disc because you had done the Behind the Dreams door for Vinegar Syndrome. Anyway, great show this week. You got me hyped to check out Fatal Games, too. It's a lot of fun. I think you'll enjoy it. But, uh, yeah, let's get back to the... Let's go to the update. Then we'll do that. We'll do the update then, and then we'll get the hell out of here. All right, let's get into this quick update. First up is a 4K Jaws 2. Dirt cheap. No slip cover, but it's all right. I'll live. It's Jaws 2. I used to watch this a lot as a kid. I've not watched it since. Uh, Roy Scheider returns. Yeah, 78. I'm sure it's okay. Um, the Jaws series definitely dropped off big time after the first one and, and got worse as each sequel went on from my memory. Then we have another classic, <sighs> Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb by Stanley Kubrick. Uh, 4K, excellent movie. Again, really cheap. Love this movie. One of his best. Uh, one of the funniest movies ever made. Love George C. Scott, Peter Sellers, Slim Pickin, James Earl Jones, uh, Sterling Hayding. Excellent film. Great stuff. Amazing. And then last but certainly not least, we have the Jackie Chan Collection Volume 2, 1983-1993 by Shout Factory. Uh, good price on this. And uh, what, what, what what's in here so we got winners and sinners wheels on meals the protector twinkle twinkle lucky stars armor of god armor of god 2 operation condor crime story and city hunter so there we go very cool uh hopefully they do a volume three or maybe some other volumes i know that screen factory shout factory whatever has been putting out a lot of these sets these uh kong kong movies and i've been picking them up and japanese films so anyways yeah back to the video all right guys thank you very much for watching and as always have a good one Bye.